Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. So I just want to welcome you to know, and it's an honor you're with us today. And today we're going to be concluding uh, the series we've been going through uh, called The Locked Door. Um, we're concluding it today. It's the last one. Um, and we've been nine weeks through this series. Um, and and it's, been, it's been awesome. And, and I really pray that, again, one of the things or something that we've talked about is really, you know, uh, you know, made sense to you or kind of been something that's kind of helped you uh, in, in this journey. And I've enjoyed uh, the studying I've done. I've enjoyed sharing my own story as we learn to unlock the doors or of the attitudes that sometimes we get locked in as humans of fear and busyness and unforgiveness and tension, unbelief, all the things that we've gone through. And today I want to conclude with the last uh, part of this series, Locked in Despair. Now, I know like these, these messages have been titled things that are like not very encouraging at all, right? Like despair and fear and all these things that we go through. But as I was thinking about despair, really what despair is, it's the absence of hope. It's a place where we have a complete lack of hope. And this could be in any area of our lives. It could be a lack of hope in our finances, where we look at our financial situation and there's a lack of hope in it where we, we just see the debt or all we see is the bills and we don't kind of have hope to ever get out of this place where it seems like we're living just like day by day, paycheck to paycheck, trying to just grind through and make it through. We might not have hope in that area. And another area might be a lack of hope in our marriages. You know, some of our marriages, maybe it seems like things are hanging on by a thread and, 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 and reconciliation and reconnection seems challenging. And I think we're in these places where hope uh, is kind of a distant thought for us, where despair is what we face every single day. Maybe it's in your health or in your relationships or despair at work or whatever it might look like. I think despair um, is something that at some points in our lives we tend to follow or we tend to have happen as moments where hope seems to have vanished and we're left face to face with our hardest moments and the things that we're struggling with. And you may have walked into church even this morning with a, a heavy heart, a heart of despair, maybe looking for answers or looking for hope or looking for something that, that's worth living for, or something that's worth you know, giving our lives to. We may have walked into church with heavy hearts this morning. But one thing I want to encourage you with more than anything is that we serve the God of the impossible. No matter what we go through, and I know that what we go through sometimes is very difficult, we serve the God of the impossible who will take our little and turn it into an abundance. And so what I want to do is I want to go through kind of a, a unique story, kind of a short story that kind of comes in the Bible, and it's in 2 Kings uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 to 7. And the title of this story in my Bible is, Elisha Helps a Poor Widow. A Poor Widow. And so if we look at this, verse 1 says this, One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take away my two sons as slaves. Now this is, if you're looking at a moment of despair, this is a desperate moment. A moment where this, this, this mother, this widow whose husband is gone, as creditors come and say, hey, you have to pay back all of this debt. And how we're going to do it is we're going to take away your kids and they're going to work this debt off for you. This moment of desperate despair. She's experiencing many things in this moment. Of course, she's experiencing the loss of her husband who would have at the time been the, the provider for her and her family. So not just her husband, but the one who actually was providing for her and her family. And then on top of that, this fear comes of losing her children. 
which as a parent, I think is one of the biggest fears that we can face is the thought of losing our kids, you know, losing them to whatever it might be. That's one of the biggest fears we have as parents. And what happens is, is her despair leads her to this desperate place. See, when we become desperate, we will do things that we maybe never even thought was possible. We'll say things, we'll, we'll work hard, we'll do whatever it takes to make sense or to make our situation work. And that's where she finds herself. And I, I had a moment yesterday uh, where this didn't happen, where I didn't have a desperate, where desperation didn't lead me to victory. This is a true story. Beth was working yesterday and she took her van, which has our two car seats in it. And in my car, still to this day, we only have one car seat. So for me to take both of my kids out in my car is pretty much impossible. Well, it's possible, but very illegal, right? And maybe not safe. So I could do it, but I was like, I probably shouldn't do it. And, but Jane was asking, she's been asking for candy and for Slurpees. And, and, and I was like, oh, you know what? We just got this bike trailer and I got a bike. I'll bike us to the gas station and we can get some candy and get some Slurpees. It was a horrible idea. Do you want to know why? Because I'm not very good at riding my bike. In fact, I think I've ridden a bike twice in the past year and they both happened in the past seven days. Okay, I do not ride my bike. I used to kind of more but not really. Like, I'm not a bike rider. And now, like, going up hills on a bike yourself is hard, okay? But when you're pulling your children, it's even harder. Now, I went into that. I started, I was like, man, no problem. You know what I mean? Like, like, I can get my kids. Jane wants some candy. I'll do it. I'm dad. I can get her there. And to be honest, I started out pretty confident that I was going to be able to get her to the gas station. Now, where we live, the closest gas station uh, drive is like five minutes from my house, right? So I don't live close to a gas station at all. It's not like I could just go to the corner, boom, there's a gas station. And, and then I decided, you know what we'll do before we go? What I'm going to do is we're going to go to the park together. So I went the long way around. We get to the park, we're playing, and then Jane's like, Dad, let's go to the candy store. And I was like, oh, I forgot about that part, all right? So we get back on the bike. I buckle them into their, to their thing, and we're going. And we're like halfway up, I know, the third hill. And I'm like, this isn't good. My legs are not feeling very good right now. And I remember looking, and I told Jane, I'm like, Jane, I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to the, to the candy store. I'm going to try, but I don't think I can do it. And then in the back, I'm not kidding you. She's like, dad, you can do it. Just keep on pedaling. And I'm like, Phew. I was like, let's go, right? Like I was fired up. I'm like, my kid's back there telling me I can do it. I'm like, let's go. So I keep pedaling. I'm like, I don't think I can do it, you know? And she's like, dad, keep on pedaling. Like, it's like a movie, right? This epic scene. And I'm just like, I'm not even sweating. My legs just feel like they don't want to work anymore. And so I'm up and I get up the hill. And I'm like, Phew. We did it. And then I look ahead. I'm like, oh, no. There's always another hill. And why is it that it's always uphill? How come we can't just bike downhill the whole time? That's easy. We had one downhill. I'm like, look at me. I'm the best. I'm going to go to the Tour de France, right? Like, like I'm going to pull my kids in this, in this race. I'm, I'm killing it. We get up the hill. And I, and I look. I'm like, there's one more hill to the gas station. And I'm, not, I'm talking. In a, you could walk there in three minutes. I told Jane, I'm like, it's not going to happen, buddy. There's, there's, there's no way my legs are going to get us there and back. Called Beth. I'm like, when are you going to be back? She's like, 6 o'clock. Um, I look at my phone. It's 3.30. I'm like, this isn't, this isn't a good situation to find yourself as a dad. You're like, man, I'm a hero. And then you realize, wow, I'm, I don't even know what I'm doing in my life. Right? Like, and so, so I tell Jane, I'm like, Jane, it's, not, it's just not going to happen. And so we ended up biking back home, and I made it home, and we didn't get our candy. But I looked in our diaper bag, found three pieces of candy. Jane got one, I got two, because I did all the hard work, okay? <laughs> I wish I was joking about that part. I'm not. I had to, but I, I was tough. This moment where 
I was desperate to get home and I didn't know if I could do it. And I just remember Jane in the back, dad, you can do it. You can pedal, keep on pedaling. And I remember being so encouraged. And, and I, as I was thinking about desperation, this is what desperation does. It, it forces us or it causes us to do things that maybe we couldn't have even imagined we were capable of before. Where things get so tough that we gotta, we gotta figure out how to get out of this situation. And this is exactly where this woman, this widow, found herself was desperate to keep her children. And so what does she do? She goes to the prophet and she says, my husband who worked for you, he served you, he's dead. And people are coming to take away my kids. That's a desperate place to find yourself. She says, how how do I protect my kids? My husband's gone and I don't know what to do. I think we've all found ourselves in moments where we look at our situation, we're like, I don't know what to do. We're almost in a situation where we're like, I don't even know if I'm gonna make it home on the bike. I don't know if I'm gonna make it through. We all have these moments where where we are so desperate and and desperation is, is a part of what we do. And then this, this is what happens in verse two. It says, what can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she says this, nothing at all except a flask of olive oil. She's like, that's all I got. When I look at my home, anything of value, the only thing that has any value is just this little jar, this little flask of olive oil. What do you have in your house? She says, I don't got much of value. It's not even close to be able to afford to pay these people back. And in fact, it's not just about paying these people back. What am I gonna do for the rest of my kids' lives? How am I gonna provide for them? How am I gonna make sure they're okay? What am I supposed to do? All I have is this little that I have. I don't have much. See, I think in times of despair, we're always looking for what we don't have. Right, when we're in desperate moments, it's always about what I don't have, what my lack is, where my struggle is. We're looking at our lack. We say things like, if only I had more money, then I'd be happy. If only, if only I had more money, if if only my kids would call me more, then... If only I had a better doctor. If only my my spouse was better. If only my spouse would sleep with me more, then I'd be okay. Then everything would be fine. We're always looking at what we don't have. And I think Elisha in this moment tells this woman, stop looking at what you don't have and look at what you already have. What do you have? I think we become desperate because our eyes were focused on our lack, not on what we have already been blessed with. This part of this question is to shift her eyes from her lack to what she has. See, I think all of us have something. We all have something that God has given us, something in our house or something in our hands. We have something. But I think when we look at it, we look at it as worthless and of little value. And we see this not only in material things, but we see this in our own life. We say, God, why didn't I get this talent? Or why can't I do this? Or why didn't you call me to do that? And so we sit back and we're like, God, I want this. And he's like, but look what I've already given you. Take care of what I've already given you. More can come if you were faithful with the little that you have. I think we stop being faithful because we we think that what we have is worth nothing. Why would I invest in something that's useless? Why would I invest in something that people have told me my whole life is dumb? Why would I invest my time or my energy into this because it's not worth anything? And so our eyes are on our lack See, then God has given us each something to cherish and something to be faithful with and something to take care of. We all have something. It might be your experience. It might be a talent. It might be your spouse. It might be your kids. It might be your education. It could be anything. 
that God has given you an idea. I think God oftentimes will use what we already have to bring the miracle. And I think this happens when we shift our eyes from what we don't have to what we do have. And I think this starts by doing an inventory of what we actually have. You might say, man, I need this much to pay this bill. What do you already have? What do you have? What blessings do you have in your life? What do you have right now that you were praying for years ago and you have it now? And then what's happened is that blessing that we had has almost become the problem. What do you have? And then Elisha gives, this, this, gives her this master plan. In verse three, and Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. Here's the plan. There you go. Go to your neighbors. Maybe the people you don't even know that well. Go to your friends. Go to your neighbors and ask them to borrow their jars. That's the plan. And what you're going to do is that little flask you have of oil, just start pouring it into these big jars. Now imagine the lady's like, do you know how liquids work, Elisha? If I pour my flask into this jar, what's going to happen is it's not going to fill the jar. It's, it's, it's a little bit, and these jars are big. I don't think, like, I don't know if you know how this works. See, I think once we realize what's in our hand, the beauty of this is once we realize what we have, the next step is to invite other people into the miracle. To invite other people into the solution. To say, hey, I'm gonna go to my friends and my neighbors and I'm gonna ask them to pray for me. I'm gonna go to my church and I'm gonna say, hey, I need you, I need you guys here for me. I'm struggling, I'm going to the hospital, I need someone to come with me. We need to invite other people into the process. And like she says, go to your friends and neighbors and borrow. See, these people didn't even give her anything. All they gave her was a, a place to hold oil. And then they were going to get it back. They didn't, they didn't give her money. They, they didn't give her anything. They just gave her these empty jars of little value. See, we maximize what we have when we bring it into community. We maximize our talent and we maximize our gift and we maximize the blessing and we pool it together to serve each other. See, this miracle that we're about to see starts in a place of what do I have, but then I need other people to be a part of this journey. To other people to be a part of hope and bringing hope back into my life. I need somebody else to be a part of it. We maximize what we have when we bring it into community. See, I talk about community and connection a lot. Why? Because it's vital for us as followers of Jesus. It's vital for overcoming despair. It's vital for human life is community and connection. We need one another. And you know what's hard? Is asking for help. You know, the humbling place that this lady must have gone through to go to her neighbors, they know her situation. And she says, hey, I need some jars. How many? As many as you got. Give me your jars. It's a humbling place to ask for help. To ask for prayer. It's humbling to know that you need somebody else in your life. It's not easy. It's very humbling, but it's the most beautiful place we can find ourselves is when we push past our pride and we push past our desire to be perfect and we push past our desire to present ourselves in a certain way and we approach each other in humility saying, I need your help. I need your help. When we don't have enough, what do we do? We ask for help. See, again, what she got from her neighbors didn't have this crazy value, but it brought other people into her story. It brought other people into it. She was just borrowing these jars, but she needed the people around her. 
She needed their help. And so she does exactly what Elisha told her. Verse five. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you or your sons can live on whatever is left over. This is the provision, right? This is the miracle. This is God doing what he does best, which is the impossible. This little flask, this little jar, all she had, it wasn't a lot. It wasn't a bank account full. It was a little jar of oil that as she created space in her life, as she created space by asking for help, she got all these jars and she filled them all right to the top. Every single one. They just, her sons keep bringing these jars, bringing the jar, bringing the jar, more and more space, more and more space, and they keep getting filled. See, she grew her capacity by asking for help. See, in, in this moment of, of despair, she didn't have enough space to hold the miracle. She didn't have enough space to hold the blessing. She didn't have enough space to hold the abundance. And see, the blessing stopped when she ran out of space, when she ran out of jars. And I can imagine, if I'm her, my first thought is, man, I wish I would have asked for more jars, you know. I wish I would have gone to my more neighbors and asked for more. Like, what if I would have asked everybody, give me your jar, watch what's going to happen. She created space for the miracle. See, I think in despair, if we're in a space of despair, there's this formula or this idea of what I have plus what my community has is placed in God's hands. That's when abundance will come. That's when the miracle, that's when hope will come again. With what I have plus what we have together is placed in God's hands. No matter how small, no matter how big, no matter how valuable, or no matter if it's worth nothing, we bring it into his hands and the blessing will come. See, this is a story that, that is repeated over and over and over in Scripture. A moment where somebody brings their little and God turns it into a lot. There's that boy with the little couple of fish and some bread. He brings it to Jesus and 5,000 people are fed in one moment. See, the kid could have said, this isn't enough. This isn't enough. I can't feed all these people. In fact, the disciples were like, hey, Jesus, like... This is what we got. And they're kind of scared, right? Like, ooh, I don't know. Like, Jesus can be mad. We should have got more. And Jesus like, yo, give it to me. Blessing pour out on people. There was leftovers. And in fact, you see here, the debt's paid. And then what does he say? And you and your sons can live on what's left over. See, this miracle wasn't just to get her out of debt. It was to provide for her the rest of her life. The rest of her life. I'm going to be honest, I don't know the rest of this woman's story, but I guarantee you there's other moments in her life where despair came up. You know what she probably did? She probably looked back to the oil and said, thank you, Jesus. You did it for me then, you can do it for me again. He did it for you then, he can do it for you now. So the question is, what do you have? In your desperate place, in this desperate sense of who you are, when despair is there, what do you have? It might be someone encouraging you along the way to keep on pedaling. Now, I'll be honest, when she said that, I, like I told you before, I was fired up. Like I'm telling you, I was like, I'm gonna pedal forever, you know what I mean? I didn't, to be fair, but I tried, you know? Sometimes it's just somebody there encouraging you to keep on going. And I'll be honest, if I was alone on that bike, I would have walked a lot more than I already did. I would have pushed that bike a lot more than I already did. It might be somebody to help you move. 
It might be something that God has given you, placed in your life that you've kind of just let get dusty in the corner and God's like, no, bring it back. The dream or the vision or the idea that God has placed inside of you that you've let just sit in the corner, bring it back. The next question, are you willing to place your little in God's hands? Are you willing to place it in God's hands? Are you willing to take your small and say, God, I trust you with it? I think sometimes we're embarrassed by the little we have and we aren't really willing. So we're not really willing to give it to God. We're like, God, until I can make it, make it on my own, I'm gonna keep what I got and then I'll give you. When I finally have the abundance, then I'll give it to you. That's not how it works. We give it to him now, we're embarrassed. You know, there's been moments in Beth and I's lives where we literally were scrounging through our vehicle for change to try and pay for gas to get home. Like that's, that's been happened in our life, true story. There's been hard moments where despair is tough or like what, and our eyes have to be on what do I have? I'm gonna give it to Jesus. Now, I've shared this before with my dad. Uh, my dad was in a car accident, or uh, he was hit by a taxi in Las Vegas and he's in the hospital for a long, long time. And I remember when he got home, my school at the time was doing this food drive. They were collecting food for people in the community and people in the school who were in need of food and you know, going through hard moments. And I remember I looked at my mom like, mom, we gotta bring something. We gotta bring something to this food drive. That's always been my heart. It's always like, 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 I'll go without so someone else can have, right? And so our pantry was bare. My dad was the sole provider for our family. And so money was very tight for us. And I, I can imagine my mom was like, this isn't a good idea though, son. But she never said that. She said, let's do it, right? So I think I had like a jar of peanut butter in a, and like a jar of corn, you know, like a, that's what we had. So I brought it to school, gave it to the food drive and, I don't remember if it was that day or that week, we get a knock on our door and it's someone from the school and they're like, yo, we got this food for you. And they started bringing in, I'm not joking, like, like boxes of canned food and, and fresh food and they just brought it into our home. And as we're sorting through it, my mom looks, she's like, hey, didn't we bring this peanut butter this week? I'm like, I think so, mom, right? The corn, boom, there it was. I don't remember exactly, but it was, what it was, but the same things we had given, boom, we're back in our pantry, and now our pantry was full. See, we, we took the little we had. See, I think if we're willing to give God our little, I promise you, he will provide for you. How do I know? Because I've experienced it almost weekly. I promise you he'll meet you in your most desperate moment. How do I know? Because I've experienced it moment after moment. I promise you he'll comfort you. I've seen it over and over again, this provision, this hope that makes no sense. A healing that makes no sense. Peace and joy that make no logical sense, but we're filled the beauty of who he is. I wanna close our series on the locked door with this, the, the, this verse coming in the context of prayer, Matthew chapter seven, verse seven to eight. In fact, it's entitled Effective Prayer. It says this, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. What I want to encourage us all with, whatever maybe we've locked ourselves behind, sometimes we feel trapped behind it, just keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. Keep on going. Keep on trying. Get back up and keep on fighting. Don't quit. No matter what you've locked yourself in, there's a way out and his name's Jesus. Don't quit. Our takeaway today, kind of a takeaway from the whole series is this. 
the key to unlock any door you find yourself locked behind is Jesus. Keep on knocking. Bring your burdens. Bring your pain. Bring your anger. Bring your inadequacy. Bring your failure. Bring your despair. Bring your unforgiveness. Bring your busyness. Bring it and lay it at his feet. Give it to him. Keep on asking. Keep on fighting. Ask for help. Ask for prayer. You can do it. Just keep on going. Keep on pedaling. You got it. And even if you have to get off the bike and push it for a while, you're still going in the right direction, just a little slower. You got it. You know, as we close the service, I just want to encourage you to stand with us and we're going to pray together. And you know, as we pray, I really want to encourage you to think about maybe some of the things you've locked yourself behind. Maybe something we've talked about, maybe something else. Maybe something even about to spare your current situation or your current moment. Just close your eyes and give it to Jesus. Just give it to him. So, Father, we need you. God, I pray that that when we don't have hope, I thank you that you are our hope, that you are the hope of the world. And God, I pray that our desperation will lead us to your feet. God, I pray that we will not be embarrassed and we won't be afraid to give you our little. We won't be afraid of what people might think. Or, God, I pray that we will just give you our little. And God, I thank you that you promise to make a way. A way when there is no way. These ways that we've seen before in our our lives and in our friends' lives and In the world, we've seen moment after moment of you making a way where there was no way. And God, I pray that you do that for us right now. God, I pray that today as we knock on the door, God, I thank you that it will be open. And God, I pray that we will never again lock ourselves behind these doors. We'll no longer lock ourselves behind these attitudes. God, I pray that you meet us where we are that we go forward carrying the message of hope and joy, the message of the gospel, of salvation to the streets and to our homes, to our workplaces. God, God, today we open the door and we don't look back. We open the door and we don't look back. And God, I thank you that you're encouraging us. God, I thank you that we are so loved by you. So God, I thank you for courage and strength to go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptizing them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give it up for Jesus in the house today.